much. Um, I apologize for the typo on Janusz's name. It should have a Z at the end, so thank you for so pointing that out. Happens. So it happens, you know. I put this together after I got back from Poland. I think I was jet lagged. But um, thank you for inviting me to this very interesting conference. And um, I am going to talk about a not a cheery topic. I'm not going to so much talk about the book that I wrote, which is here. The reason that um, what I'm going to talk about is Treblinka. And the idea that's where um, Dr. Korczak and the orphans found their end. They were murdered there. And so my suggestion was that perhaps that that would be an interesting topic. And I did a lot of research about Treblinka because my father-in-law, Sam Goldberg, who I wrote about in this book, um, was at Treblinka for 13 months, which is the longest. There was only one other person that survived Treblinka that was there for 13 months. So, and he was part of the uprising, and it, I did a lot of work on trying to understand what that place was. So, without further ado, um, I wanted to just, I know you all are very familiar with um, Dr. Korczak, and I, when I did my research, I of course had heard about him, and then I realized, oh, that's not actually his birth name. His birth name is Henrik Goldschmidt, which um, he took the name Janusz Korczak as a pen name as he was writing his children's books. So that was, that was interesting for me. And, but the story really revolves here today for Dr. Korczak and his orphanage children around Treblinka. But in order to understand Treblinka, so um, I guess fair warning that this is not going to be a cheery, a cheery talk. So I apologize in advance about that. But it's really important to understand what happened in this place where 870,000 mostly Jews, a few thousand Roma, were, were murdered um, in, in gas chambers and by shooting and by hanging and by starvation in, in any, well, there really wasn't that much starvation to be honest because people weren't there long enough to starve. That's the truth about that. So it all starts though with this gentleman, Adolf Hitler, who had this great world theory that the Aryan race, the German people, are of the highest caliber of people in the world, and that everyone else is below them, is other. And the Jews had a particularly low status as subhuman. They were not human, in fact, they were vermin, and they needed to be eradicated. But I think Hitler in the beginning didn't think he would be so successful and just as successful as he was in eradicating the Jews of Europe. So he thought that he would get rid of them. He wanted to make German and German-controlled territories Judenrein, free or clean of Jews. That was his original idea. So like in 1939, when he attacks Poland from the West, he doesn't have a plan. That's the, what we know now in 2019 that's called the final solution of the Jewish question, to murder the Jews of Europe where they live, in the place, mostly on Polish soil. And, um, but this is what happens in the beginning. So I'm going to use my, my cursor. I'm just going to use over here, if people can look over here for just a second. Um, this map really helped me understand my in-laws story during the war much better than I did before. And I find that it's, um, well, you'll see why I think it's useful for, for the beginning of this story. So here is Germany, and here is the Soviet Union, and this is Poland, this over here. Now, Germany and the Soviet Union make a friendship pact in, in August, end of August 1939. They say, hey, we'll be friends, let's make a deal. We won't attack each other. You, we, we, the Germans, will attack from the west, attack Poland from the west, from this way, and the you guys, the Soviets, Stalin, you attack from the east. Then we'll split it down the middle, pretty much down the middle, and you take that side, we take this side, that's a deal. That was the deal they cut. And that's in fact what happened. September 1, 1939, the Germans attacked from the west. Two weeks later, the Soviets attacked from the east. And this is in fact the border that becomes the border between the German-controlled part of Poland and the Soviet-controlled part of Poland. Now, over here, the Germans very quickly annexed, I, uh, my, my cursor's not exactly the right place, but they annexed like a chunk over here that had, in the olden days, been part of what, what they considered to be Germany. Then Soviets controlled this, and then in the middle here, there was this section 
of Poland that was under German control called the general government or general gov government, if you want to sound, make it sound fancy, in, in English it's easier to say government, and um, that is the area where my in-laws' families were from. Bagatella is my father-in-law Sam Goldberg's family town. It's tiny. When I say tiny, I mean really, really tiny farming village. And my mother-in-law Esther Vishnu is from Sochik, which it's not too far away, but they, they didn't know each other until until 1943. And um, but her town is a shtetl, a very typical Jewish shtetl. It's a little town, primarily inhabited by Jewish people. Her father. Her, where my father-in-law's family, Sam's family, was, were farmers and, and traders in timber and cattle. My, my mother-in-law's family were, he was a, her father was a teacher of young children about Jewish subjects, a malamit, it's called in, in Yiddish. So, like this, it was not, even though there was no plan to murder all the Jews under German control, they wanted them really to leave. It wasn't a good idea, it wasn't a happy place to stay and live as a Jew. And so, like hundreds of thousands of other Jews living in this German-controlled area, um, both the Vishnu family and the Goldberg family go across that yellow line. They go east. And um, Esther's family went pretty far east, and Sam's family just went a little bit east. But they lived under Soviet control in those first almost two years of the war. You could be a citizen. You weren't murdered. You could be the Soviets, in fact. They didn't believe in religion. So a, a, a Jewish person was a citizen, just like a Catholic person, like a Russian Orthodox person. Everyone was a citizen. Fine. But then Hitler takes his lovely agreement that he makes with the Soviet Union and he rips it up. June 22nd, 1941, so almost two years later, and Germany attacks the Soviet Union. And they start from that yellow line, and they go this way into the eastern area of Poland, and then further in with four four battalions of, of army units into the areas of the former Soviet Union. And this is where we begin to see what we now know as the final solution. Because the army units were followed very quickly by a special army unit called the Einsatzgruppen. And their job was to go to each town that was conquered by the Germans and gather the Jews of the town and take them out of town and shoot them into a pit, one by one, with bullets. And this is how Esther's family were all murdered in Slonim, which is, um, there were about 10,000 Jews in Slonim, and in August of 1941, they were all taken out of town and shot one by one into a pit. Esther survived that massacre because she was suffering from typhus, and she was in a hospital in Slonim when this massacre happened. And uh, miraculously, she left because a few days later, the Einsatzgruppen came back to Slonim to mop up, clean up, and they went into that same hospital, and they murdered all of the patients in their beds, which were all Jewish patients. Now, I don't, I'm hoping that Esther didn't know that that happened, because she like left, but I found it through different through my research, a different testimony that someone testified about this murder, and I'm like, what? Two days after she gets the hell out of there, they come back and kill everybody. Whoa, okay. Um, the truth is though, anybody that survived the Holocaust has many of these miraculous stories that happened to them. Because otherwise they most people didn't survive, right? So this happens, this Slonim massacre happens, and they kill in this manner a million, either, or some, you know, who know, numbers are, you, no one knows real numbers, but somewhere between a million and 1.3 million people are murdered, Jews are murdered, east of that yellow line by the Einsatzgruppen with bullets. Now mind you, they had local people who helped them, some voluntary, some not voluntary, but they did this mass murder in the math, these called mass killing fields, um, over and over again. And these soldiers, even though they were well trained to try their best to see the people they were killing, not as people, but as vermin, to make it so that they could do it, it was still really tough. There were nervous breakdowns all day long. They're shooting human beings this far, this far away from each other. 
I'm thinking, I'm shooting you, God forbid. But it's very close. It's very personal. They don't like having nervous breakdowns. And they, they had so much alcohol. There are stories and stories about how before they'd go, they'd send the, the soldiers out to these, to these killing fields, that they would get all the, all the, all the soldiers drunk. And that's how they, and then there was more drink later. It was like constantly drunk in order to get them to carry out this horrible, horrible act. So they were, the German echelon in the Reich were trying to figure out a better way to do this. There had to be a better way. So they looked into their, into their grab bag of ways to kill people, and they had a good example. And the example was from the T4, it's called T4 because of the street it was on. It's the euthanasia program that Hitler began in July of 1939. And it went all the way until August 1941, where they took mentally ill people, child, started out with children, but then it relatively quickly graduated to adults as well. Handicapped people, mentally ill people, and people that they deemed were not worthy of life. And they took them to these, they took them on a bus to these hospitals, and doctors, real doctors, MDs, dressed in white coats, would um, take a look at these people and say, we will treat you, and then they would murder them. And they would write back to their families, we're so sorry, you know, your, your loved one died in our care. They didn't, know, they didn't, no one knew they were murdering all these people. But they started doing it first with lethal injections, and then this way and that way, but they ultimately found that gas, gassing them, was a really great way to murder these, these people. So they, these doctors had experimented for these two years with killing by gas. So they tried it out at Auschwitz. Now, Auschwitz was a place that did not start out as a death extermination place of Jews. It started out as a prisoner of war camp for Poles. It began in spring of 1940. And prisoners of war, Polish prisoners of war, were taken here. And then after the Germans attacked the Soviet Union in June of 1942, there were, excuse me, but like just a, a shitload more of prisoners of war. And they got many, many hundreds of thousands of them were sent to concentration camps, one of them being Auschwitz. And it was in September of 1941. So remember, that's just wait, June, July, August, September. That's three months after Germany attacked the Soviet Union. They try out the idea of murdering some of these prisoners with gas. They tried out in the infamous Block 11 at Auschwitz, which was the torture, well-known, it's well-known place, of, that it was the place of torture and murder, and they did the gas experiment in Block 11, and it worked great. Rudolf Hess, Hoss, who was the commandant of Auschwitz, said, was so happy that this worked so well. He was like, this is great. Now we have a solution, an alternative, to all the shooting, okay? This is how it starts. Then they tried it out in Chalno. Chalno, in December 8, 1941, so remember the experiment is September, now we're just jump a couple of months ahead. They took Jews, they started out with Jews from Lodz, town nearby, and they put them into trucks. And the back of the truck was sealed, like a cupboard, and they took the, a pipe from the exhaust. So, you know, I, trucks, unless you have an electric car, makes exhaust, and you, they put the pipe right into the cabin of the car, and then they would close it, and they would drive the vans a ways, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes, 50 minutes, out into the forest. By the time they got out to the forest, everyone inside was dead. They were asphyxiated from the carbon monoxide, from the, the, van, the vehicle that they were in. Then they would dump them into a pit, and go back and do it again. And this started in Chalmo, so this was working great. This was a, this was a really better way to, to murder people. No one had to see them die. No one had to physically shoot anybody. This was, this was a good plan. This is a picture of some um, Jews from Lodz leaving their town, um, going to die in Chalmo in, in these vans. They had their packages. At this stage of the game, the final solution, um, these people really, I don't think, had any idea of what was about to happen to them. The death camps hadn't been built yet. They thought they were being relocated, taking you know the small packages that they could carry, but um, they didn't. They didn't get relocated. They got murdered. 
And so then, December 1941, we're still at the end of 1941, Hitler says, the world war is here. The annihilation of world Jewry must be the necessary outcome, consequence. And Hans Frank, who was the governor of that area that uh, in Poland, controlled by Germans, called the general government, he was really another really terrible guy. He told all of his people, all of his like officers that had to go out into the field and were tasked with this job, gentlemen, I must ask you to rid yourselves of all feeling of pity. We must annihilate the Jews wherever we find them in order to maintain the structure of the Reich as a whole. So extermination of the Jews becomes a wartime policy. And they, they sell it to their people by making them believe that it is, we are talking about the survival of the German people. We must kill all the Jews in order for the German people to survive. They, they, they made it seem like it was an act of self-defense to kill the Jews, and they weren't real people anyway, so it's okay. So at the Varsi Conference, another month later, this is where all the leaders of the Reich get together and really get their marching orders about how we're going to do this. It's a famous conference. There's all kinds of studies about it. But what happens, oh, before we get to the, de to this, the setting up of the death camps, and this quote is very powerful. So it's a month after Vanessi. The Fuhrer declares once again that he has decided, once again, really, once again, that he has decided to do away ruthlessly with the Jews in Europe. In this matter, one should not have any sentimental impulses. The Jews have deserved the catastrophe that they are now experiencing. We must accelerate this process with cold determination, as in so doing, we render a priceless service to humanity, which for millennia was tortured by Jews. Okay, this is from, by Goebbels, who was the propaganda minister. This was the line that was fed to everyone who was involved in this process. So, they built killing centers, I call them death camps, and there were three that were built in between January, let's say February of 1942, and. June of 1942, June, July. The first one that's built, so Chelmda we talked about already, and the first one that's built is Belzec, then Sobibor, and then Treblinka. These become the triumvirate of what, what is known in Holocaust colloquium as the, the death camps, or the Operation Reinhard death camps, and I'll explain that in a second. But before I explain that, I just want to point out, on this map also has Auschwitz and Majdanek. Now, Auschwitz, I explained, started out as a prisoner of war camp, a slave labor camp. And then, around 19, end of 1942, 43, it becomes a hybrid extermination camp when, when Birkenau was built with five gas chambers and crematoria and, and to, to start to murder more Jews. They needed more capacity to kill all those Jews. Because now they had to get rid of the Jews, but getting rid of the Jews meant murdering the Jews. And then Majdanek is a very similar story. It was built as a prisoner of war camp, as a slave labor camp. Jews and non-Jews were in Majdanek until the end. Uh, well, the Jews were all murdered before the end of the camp, but it became um, also an extermination, a place of extermination. But when people talk about the Operation Reinhard death camps, of which Treblinka is one, they're referring to this gentleman, may he rot in hell, Reinhard Heydrich, who was one of the master plan planners of the final solution. He was murdered um, in Czechoslovakia, where he was the, the, the governor, the German governor, in May of 1942. And Hitler and Himmler were so upset by his murder, their good friend, they decided to name the, the operation of these death camps, Belgium, Sobibor, and Treblinka, after him as an honor to him. So that's why they're called Operation Reinhardt Camps. So now let's focus on Treblinka. Can you give me a 10 minute warning when I should try to uh, hurry up? Let's say 12 minutes from now. Okay. 15. 15. Yeah, okay. I can't do this in 12. No, no, okay. That's okay. Right. Yeah, All right, here we go. Easy. The first commandant of Treblinka was Dr. Irmfrin Eberl. He was trained at that euthanasia program that I mentioned before. He was a physician, a medical physician, who was the first commandant. And, uh, like, I think it's around 92 of the doctors and, and medical personnel that were at Operation T4, the euthanasia program, were, after it was shut down in 41, 
they were repurposed and put into the death camps to run these gas extermination program. And um, my father-in-law, Sam Goldberg, was captured in a town that's about 15 miles away from Treblinka in June of 1942. 135 men were captured and taken there by truck. Their job was to build the camp. And this was a pattern that was used by all, for all the Operation Reinhardt death camps. They captured Jews in nearby towns and brought them to the area and had them build the camp, except the gas chambers. So my father-in-law was forced to build the camp, and he, he survived in this camp until the uprising, August of 1943. So this is the, a picture of the Unschplatz, which you pronounced much better than I can, Unschlagplatz um, in Warsaw, where the Jews were taken. Treblinka was built where it was because it was 65 miles away from Warsaw, and it was built with the specific intent of primarily murdering the Jews of Warsaw. It was the largest Jewish population in all of Poland and concentrated in one place. And by the time, many Jews from outlying areas were also brought there to the ghetto. So it was a huge Jewish population, and they were brought here to this place and taken from here by train to Treblinka, the 65 miles. The deportations began on July 22, 1942, and the murdering began the next day. July 23rd, 1942. Now, it was 13 days later that Dr. Korchak and his orphans are deported August 5th, 1942. That's when they were deported to, 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 uh, to Treblinka. And when I, I, I looked this up for, to prepare for this talk, and I was like, wow, they were taken very early in that action. But every day, five to 7,000 Warsaw Jews were transported to Treblinka by train. So they were of the five to seven, 5,000 Jews that were taken on that one day. And what happened was, Dr. Erbrell that I mentioned, he was a commandant, he wanted to impress Hitler and Hitler, and he wanted to be like the star commandant and kill the most Jews of any death camp. That was his goal. There were, but there were only three small small gas chambers set up in Treblinka. They could fit 250 to 350 people, something like that. So you couldn't kill 5,000 people a day in three small gas chambers. So at the end of August, September, they're building more. But in the meantime, he orders the Ukrainian guards to start shooting people as they get off the trains. Because just shoot, shoot a bunch of them right away, then we'll get rid of their bodies, and we won't have to fit them into the gas chambers. It'll be much easier. So I was trying to imagine this, that, that changes because he makes a big fat mess of everything because bodies, excuse me, this is a really awful image, but bodies start piling up all over the, the camp because they, they're shooting them as they're coming off the train and they don't have enough people to like get them out of the way. So the place is stinks like hell and there's bodies everywhere. And people describe it as just this, really this scene from some really horror movie that thank God hasn't been written yet, and at least not that I've seen. So um, I was trying to imagine what, would it, what was it like when Dr. Karchak got off the train with these orphans. The main procedure took about 90 minutes. Get off the train, the men and women were separated. So I don't know what happened with Dr. Korchak and his orphans, whether the girls and boys were separated or he was able to keep them together. I don't know. But generally, the, the, the men and the women were separated. The men and especially in the beginning, were undressed outside in the reception area, and then taken straight down what, what people called the road, what they called the road to heaven, straight into the gas chamber. The women and the girls were taken into an indoor undressing barracks where they undressed and had their hair shorn, and then they too had to run down the road to heaven, straight into the gas chamber. The whole process took 90 minutes until they were dead. In the gas chamber, it only took 25 minutes to murder. So I was wondering, I read this in Timothy Snyder's book, and not that I'm a doctor, I am I'm not, I'm married to one, but I'm not. But I found this to be an interesting idea, like how exactly, they were killed by carbon monoxide. It was in, similar to the, to the Khando vans, there was um, a, a old Soviet truck, old Soviet tank actually, that the exhaust from it was piped into the, into the gas chamber, and that's, that's what killed them. And um, carbon monoxide binds much better than oxygen to the hemoglobin in the blood, and thereby prevents red blood cells from performing their normal function of bringing oxygen to tissues. 
So basically their, their cells were asphyxiated by, by the gas. That's really what happened to them. And um, that was, when I read that, I was like, oh, because, I mean, that was pretty interesting for me. Interesting, like, terrifying. But um, I think that's what the place looked like, though, when Janusz Korczak was murdered there with those orphans. The place was a mess. It was whole, it was a it was a Dante's Inferno hell zone. This guy Eberl got in a lot of trouble because he was made such a mess of the place, and he got replaced at the end of August. But Korczak came on the sixth or the seventh, right? He's gone, his orphans are murdered, they're, they're over, they're history. But Eberl gets fired because they see what a mess he made. And this guy with the white, he wore this white riding jacket and he rode a horse all around Jumlinka. His name is Franz Stengel and he was appointed as the commandant. And um, he, he stayed as the commandant actually until the uprising in August of 1942, 43. So, um, I want to just, this is Kurt Franz, he was one of the worst of the worst of the, uh, of the SS officers at Treblinka, but I will tell you that if it worked for this gentleman, this horrible gentleman, but he also rotten nail, uh, my father-in-law probably wouldn't have survived. He, he liked, for some reason, he liked my father-in-law. We, 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 would, we would ask Sam, like, why did he help you? And he's like, I don't know. He said he liked my eyes. So. Sam never really understood it, but he did in fact help me. He appointed him as the, um, as the uh, supervisor of the laundry, which was a really good job at Treblinka because you were inside, you could cook in the pots, and it was actually a good job there, as jobs at Treblinka go. But I wanted to share with you some pictures. That guy, Kurt Franz, he survived the war, and um, ultimately he was caught years later, tried, and uh, put into prison until he got older and became sick, and then he was taken out and put in some nice nursing home, which pisses me off, but whatever. He took pictures of the place, and we have, Yad Vashem has the photo album, and he made these, put these, these pictures together um, in a photo album after the war, and he titled it, this is, this is so disgusting, he titled the photo album, The Good Old Days. Yad Vashem has the photo album, and this is just a few pictures because you get a glimpse because all of Treblinka was destroyed after the uprising in November, the Germans destroyed everything that was there. But this gives a tiny glimpse of what it looked like. Um, I don't think it looked like this necessarily when Korchak arrived, because that was only 13 days after operations began, and they continued to build different structures in the camp throughout. Um, this is, was a warehouse, probably a warehouse of some kind, and um, there was, believe it or not, Kurt Franz, the Lalka, he was called the Lalka because that's Polish for be beautiful, because he was so handsome. And that was his nickname. But he made a menagerie, he made a little zoo. And I'm not kidding, there were bears and foxes. These are his own pictures. That's just like, what? Okay, yeah. And then what happened was, after the, after, after the Germans lost the Battle of Stalingrad in February of 1943, Himmler got a little nervous, shall we say, that perhaps the Germans weren't going to win the war. So he commanded everyone at Treblinka to start burning the bodies of the Jews that they murdered, because they had been just throwing them into a pit, huge open graves, hundreds of thousands of bodies. They would cover them up and then do another layer. And so he ordered them to begin to burn the bodies to get rid of the evidence. But not only that, he ordered them to dredge with this big dredge thing to take the bodies out of the mass graves and burn them. So, of course, who had to do these awful jobs? It was the Jews. There was a workforce of about 800 Jews in the camp, one of whom was my father-in-law. But there was an uprising, August 2nd, 1943, and um, that's a picture of the uprising on the day that it happened from about 10 miles away. And my father-in-law was one of the planners of the uprising. Most people who were there that day did not survive the war. Half of them didn't even survive getting out of the camp. But my father-in-law did, and he ran, and he ran, and he ran, and like, the story of their meeting is after he runs away from here, my mother-in-law has been hiding in the forest about 15 miles away with the help of some Christian families. And he's running away and they meet in the forest. And he says, I just escaped from Treblinka. And she's like, what? He, what? You know, we had an uprising, he tells the whole thing, and she takes him to the Christian families that have been helping her. And they help him also. And they hide together 
for another year in a pit in the forest that they dig out near there, nearby here, and then they're liberated by the Soviet army in the summer of 1944. So um, there were other uprisings, just briefly, besides, besides um, Treblinka, the Warsaw Ghetto is very famous. Sobibor, one of the other Operation Reinhardt death camps, had an uprising October of 1943 after Treblinka's. Auschwitz, Birkenau, and the starter commandos, the people who had to work in the gas chambers, had a completely unsuccessful uprising in October of 1944. Everyone was killed that was involved in that uprising. Um, Treblinka, to summarize, had 870,000 people were murdered. Only about 65 survived till the end of the war, one of whom was my father-in-law. And of those that planned the uprising, about 12 to 15 survived. This is a very famous photo of the some of the survivors of the planning committee. And this is my father-in-law here, uh, Shuel or Sam Goldberg. And um, yeah, he was a hero. He was a hero of everyone. And uh, I was going to talk about Auschwitz and how the, the, sort of the killing centers after the, after the by the time 1943 ends, the, the death camps are, are shut down and the, the killing, the mass killing program really shifts in full force over to Auschwitz and, and Maidanek. And that's where the killing continues really until, until, until the end of the war. But I mean, just to pull this together, this is the, these are the numbers of, of where, where and how you know, the final solution of the Jewish question was, was uh, pretty nearly achieved. 90% of the Jewish population of, of Poland, anyway, which is, had the most Jews, 3.3 million, were, were murdered over the course of six years really, five years. And um, you know, the fact that, that Dr. Korchak went with his orphans to this end obviously speaks loudly about who he was. And, um, but I think that this place existed at all speaks to what we as humans have the capacity to actually do. It's hard to believe that we as hum and, and human beings could have thought this up and executed it, but it happened. And uh, I see my 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 job as like trying to not be that type of human because we make choices about what we do in life and how we live our lives and the germans and some poles made choices about how they lived in a negative way that what we see as negative some made choices to be live positively like the, the christian families that helped sam and esther like marina sandler like there are many many of these stories but um if there only had been more of those stories we wouldn't necessarily have had the same tragic result as we had. So, I'm sorry it's a sad story, but that's the story of Treblinka, where Dr. Korchak and, and his orphans um, found, found their end. So, thank you for sharing the history with me, and um, yeah, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them.